Titanic, gigantic, volcanic. That's how our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, describes the spiritual war that's going on between God and Satan, who wants to keep people in terrible bondage. Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. Today, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, exposes this conflict for our souls in his message called The Battle of the Gods. Exodus 12.12 is Dr. McGee's launching pad for our study, so if you can, turn there in your Bible. And as you do, I'll share a couple of letters that we've recently received from fellow Bible bus passengers living over in India. The first letter comes from a listener of our Chattisgari language broadcast. I am a 50-year-old farmer with a wife and three children. I was a very devout man, and because I didn't know better, I worshipped false gods for most of my life. I used to go on pilgrimages and fasted and tried to be devout. But at the same time, I was steeped in alcoholism and tobacco addiction. On the 11th of June, I found your program by accident. At first, your teaching confused and angered me. But after listening for a while and attending a listener meeting, I was convicted of my sin and got to know the true God. It took some time for me to stop worshiping idols. But now my wife and children have accepted Jesus Christ as well, and we go to church as a family every Sunday. When our village learned that we worship Jesus, they began to oppose us. Please pray for our protection and also pray that they may also accept Jesus as their Savior. And then here's a letter. This is from a listener of our Coke Baroque language broadcast. I was a Hindu priest in my village involved in witchcraft and other rituals. I also performed healing ceremonies that took money and livestock from the sick who desired to be made well. One day, I turned on the radio and heard your program, and my heart was touched by the words. Shortly after, I confessed my sins and asked to be baptized by a local Christian preacher. Today, I attend this church every Sunday and listen to your program every day. Isn't God's work amazing? You know, our world prayer team is traveling through India on our knees this week, so if you'd like to join us in lifting up listeners like these, we'd love to welcome you to the prayer team at ttb.org forward slash pray. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that shows us how to live in truth. Speak to us now and help us to identify those things in our lives that prevent us from coming to you in love and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And this morning I turn to Exodus, the 12th chapter, verse 12, not for a text, but for a launching pad to get this little rocket of my message uh, underway. Will you notice the reading of this verse? For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. A spiritual struggle is going on today, and that spiritual struggle is back of every physical struggle that there is. And it's been responsible for every war from the day that Abraham went down to deliver his nephew Lot from the cities of the plain. And may I say to you, it's responsible for that which is now labeled race riots in Los Angeles. Actually, every person seems to be explaining why it's happened. I'm not attempting to do that. I do not know. But I do know this much, that it's not a conflict between black and white, and it's not a conflict between civil rights and civil wrongs. There is a spiritual conflict that's back of every conflict today. And this spiritual conflict is between light and darkness. It's between heaven and hell. It's between good and evil. It's between God and Satan. It began before man was ever even created. It will continue here on this earth even after the church is removed from the earth. It's more far-reaching than man this morning can comprehend. It's deeper and wider than this earth. It is super-colossal. It is hyper-cosmic. 
It's extra mundane, it's titanic, gigantic, and volcanic, if you please. This is a death grapple that is long drawn out. In Scripture, every now and then it surfaces. It'll come to the surface, and you can see it in sharp conflict. Every now and then it's brought into a sharp focus in the Word of God, and you can see it plainly. It began in the Garden of Eden. You see it in the Garden of Eden as the conflict was first joined there as far as man is concerned. Then you see it in the life of two men who were twins, who were brothers. It was in the life of Jacob and Esau. You see it again taking place in the soul of that man Job as he fought his battle. You see it when God said, The Lord will have warfare with Amalek from generation to generation. There'd be no peace. There'd have to be a surrender. You see it in the conflict between Saul and David, and you see it in the conflict between David and Goliath. You see it join yonder on the top of Mount Carmel when Elijah met the prophets of Baal. You see it in the temptation of the Lord Jesus yonder in the wilderness. It is that which Paul said, The flesh warreth against the spirit, and the spirit warreth against the flesh, and these two are contrary. It's the thing that Paul mentioned, and I'm afraid a great many leaders today have not even sensed this. The thing that Paul said was, when he's writing yonder to the Corinthians, telling of the great things that were happening in Ephesus, he says, A great doe and effectual is opened unto me, but there are many adversaries. May I say to you that this morning we're looking at one of those conflicts. I think one of the outstanding examples of the conflict between Moses and Pharaoh. Actually, it had to do with the deliverance of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Seventy souls had gone down into Egypt. All of them were the offspring of Jacob. They went down because there was a friendly Pharaoh on the throne, one of the Hyksos kings who had come as a nomad, one of the Bedouins out from the desert of the same background that old Jacob had and those that came after him. Afterward, that dynasty was overthrown and the Egyptians came back upon the throne. But they became, the children of Israel became a multitude in the land of Egypt. Probably a million and a half of them went out of slavery. For 430 years they were down there in the land of Egypt, and God was silent. He said nothing. He just put them down there, and seemingly he went off and left them, did nothing about it. But at the allotted and the appointed time, God returned, at the time he said he would come and not before. He remembered his promise that he had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he said, I've heard their groaning, and now I've come down to deliver them. After 40 years' absence from Egypt, Moses appeared back in the land after God had trained him. Now God is ready. A deliverer is prepared, and Moses is now to assemble the elders of Israel, and they're all to go to Pharaoh. And his refusal would open the struggle that was to take place. And it was not between Moses and Pharaoh, actually. Pharaoh represented all the gods of Egypt, and believe me, that is quite a number. And the issue was then to be joined, and God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. This was at the end of the plagues, the end of the judgment period. I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I'm the Lord. Now, I trust that we understand, therefore, that the thing that is taking place is actually in all the plagues is a battle of the gods. That's what it was. God says, against this land of idolatry. Idolatry began in Babylon, but Babylon just played it the thing that Egypt majored in. You cannot conceive this morning the number of temples and the number of gods and images there were in the land of Egypt. It's inconceivable today. 
And God says now, I'm moving in, and with this great world power, I'll close in with them, and it will be against the gods of Egypt, not against the Egyptians, actually, or not really against Pharaoh, but against the gods of Egypt, I'll execute judgment. Now, somebody might say, well, why have this struggle in the first place? Why didn't God make this on earth and we not have any struggle? May I say to you that God is not interested for eternity to have a group of hothouse plants. He could make of his universe a great big hothouse, but he's not doing that. He wants creatures of reality, those that have faced the opposite of what he is and have met sin and have overcome sin and have come through a world of struggle that can stand with him throughout eternity. You think he wants a bunch of robots? that all he's got to do is press a button and they all go down on their faces. He does not want anyone to lick his boots. He wants them down on their knees because they want to go down on their knees. He wants to keep heaven from becoming a glorified Disneyland. And I'm afraid a great many people think heaven's going to be a great glorified Disneyland where they get off of one ride onto another. They come out of one nice little experience of entertainment into another. My friend, that's not heaven. Heaven is a place where you labor as you've never labored before. But it will not be labor. It will not be the burden that it is today. Now, the plagues that God brought on Egypt are not haphazard, they're not meaningless and purposeless. Uh, even the liberal today has dug down in these plagues, and he's come up with the interpretation that they followed nature. Well, since God is the one back of nature, I'm willing to go along with that. I believe they did, to a certain extent, follow a pattern in nature. But we need to recognize that there was the supreme strategy of heaven against all of these idols down there in that land. And that leads me to say that there is actually a fourfold reason of why God brought the judgments that he brought upon the land of Egypt. I've already indicated this. First of all, Egypt was dominated by idolatry. They had gods many and lords many, thousands of temples and millions of idols. I want to give a quotation from Dr. Wilbur Smith's book on Egypt, and he takes prophecy, of course, and has a very excellent book. Listen to this statement. The temples of Egypt and the elaborate carvings and drawings of her gods and goddesses are still the wonder of modern students, but her gods are gone. The land of idolatry has no idols today. And that's the only pagan land that doesn't have idols today. Isn't that remarkable? Dr. Reginald Stewart Poole, a great British scholar, has said this, The foundation of Memphis, and Memphis is the capital, uh, was the ancient capital of Egypt. It at one time shared honors with Thebes up in the upper uh, Nile, but uh, Memphis is the long-time capital that's gone today. The foundation of Memphis is the first event in Egypt's history, the one large historical incident in the reign of the first king. Memphis was a great mass of huge temples. It was a city eight feet long, four feet wide, a large city for that day, one of the largest of the ancient cities. Had a tremendous population, had more temples in it and idols in it, than any place has ever had on top side of this earth. And you can be sure of one thing, God's people, 430 years down in that land, had turned to idolatry. We need to remember that. Now, God's going to execute judgment against these. Now, if you think these idols are, are powerless and meaningless, I think you're wrong. You must recognize the Egyptians were intelligent people, very intelligent. We owe a, a great deal to the, that early Egyptian civilization. And the Word of God makes it clear. You will recall that Paul, writing to this young preacher Timothy, said, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses. And they withstood Moses. They, they represented the priesthood of Egypt. And they were able to duplicate the first three miracles. The rod changed into a serpent and back again. The Nile changed to blood. 
and the bringing up of the judgment of frogs, they could duplicate those three. Now, after that, they fled. But up to that, they were there. How did they do it? Well, they do it, did it by satanic power. The Greeks were intelligent people. All you've got to do is read Greek literature, Greek philosophy, and look at the monuments they've left, and no one can say the Greeks were fools or that they were an ignorant people. They were not. And yet the Greeks worshipped gods. And they went to the Oracle of Delphi, made trips there, and they got information. You think they got accurate information? Many times they got accurate information. How did they get it? May I say to you that Satan has been back of idolatry as he's back of false cults today. When anyone tells me today, oh, the false cult is meaningless, it hasn't anything in it, you just think it doesn't. It has tremendous power in it. But it's satanic power, my beloved. And we need to recognize today that there are two great spiritual forces in this world, that of God, but that of Satan also. And Satan's power is tremendous in this world. So the, the plagues were leveled at these gods of Egypt because it's a land of idolatry, and God had to once and for all make it very clear that he could judge and would judge them. The second reason is that the plagues had a tremendous message for the people of that day. I'd like to turn to the seventh chapter of Exodus, verse 5, and let's note the language of this verse. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. That's the second reason. God says, I intend to convince the Egyptians. Did you know that when the gospel first started out, that the great center of gospel preaching was not Asia, it was not Europe, but it was North Africa and was Egypt? Did you know that the four of the greatest men that the church has produced came out of North Africa? Augustine was from North Africa. Tertullian was from North Africa. Origen was from North Africa. May I say to you, these men had a preparation. They had a long history of a land that had been judged of idolatry. God says, I'll convince the Egyptian. And believe me, he did. And then there was mercy in God's judgment. We had a lovely number this morning by the choir about his mercy, the mercy of God. Well, there's mercy even in his judgments. Every time God sent a plague upon Egypt, he gave them an opportunity to repent and turn to him. Every, every plague was that. He never sent the next one until they made the decision not to turn to him. Then there is a third reason for the plagues. We're told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that for some reason, that's caused more trouble, more controversy than anything else. And I've heard more people weep over poor Pharaoh that God hardened that rascal's heart. <laughs> May I say to you that when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it really literally means he twisted it with a rope. What does that mean when it hardened his heart? What God is doing is bringing out that which is in Pharaoh's heart and making him make a decision. He, he had to hail Pharaoh into court. He had to make him stand trial. He had to face the music. And he made Pharaoh make a decision. You notice how vacillating Pharaoh was? One time he'd agree, and the next time he'd change his mind. A great many people are like that today. They say, yes, I'll take a stand for God, and they don't. May I say to you, God more or less forces people to make a decision. And he made this man Pharaoh. That's all that it means when it says God hardened his heart. He brought out of it that which was in his heart. It's the same thing that you have today. God brought him right out and made him stand the test. All God is doing is making Pharaoh bring out of his heart that which was in the heart. And the Lord Jesus says, out of the heart proceed the issues of life. And then he names some of the things that came out of the heart, and some of them are not nice. In fact, I can't find one nice one in the lot. And the Old Testament had already said that. Jeremiah says the heart is desperately wicked, and God was bringing out that which was in this man's heart. That's the purpose of the judgment. Now, the fourth and the last one is this. 
You have in the tenth chapter of the book of Exodus this statement in verse 2, And that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know that I am the Lord. Now, God must demonstrate to his own people, Israel, that he could deliver them. These people had been born in the brickyards. They were idolaters. They'd gone over, hook, line, and sinker. They'd turned from him. They were helpless. They were hopeless. There wasn't a nation on the earth that would undertake to deliver them. There wasn't anyone that would deliver them. They, had, they did not have one chance in a million of ever being delivered. So God moved in and demonstrated to them in such a way that he says that you'll be able now to tell your son. And then when your grandson comes along, you can put him on your knee and say, Look, this is what God did for us when we were slaves down in the land of Egypt. I had worked all day in the brickyards. And when I got home weary and tired because I didn't have straw, Moses said, Be ready this night, you're going out. And do you think with that tremendous army of Pharaoh we could go out? Of course we couldn't. Well, we had already seen evidences of God's hand, and that night God let us out. We went across the Red Sea, and we went into that wilderness. We still were our stiff-necked people, but our God was faithful to us. It was a definite, deliberate, and designed attack upon idolatry. That would have a message for Pharaoh. It would have a message for the Egyptians. It would have a message for the Israelites. And it would have a message here at the Church of the Open Doa this warm August Sunday morning. Now, I want us to look at these plagues for just a few moments because of the fact that I'm going to be very brief here today. It's a warm day. But I'd like to run through these and let you see something that, to me, when this came to my attention years ago as a student in college, I think it did more to lift my faith than anything else. You see, because I'd always felt that these plagues were just haphazard. They just, whatever came to the mind of the Lord, he threw it in. Wasn't that tall? First plague, the Nile is turned to blood. As Dr. Adams says, Egypt is the Nile. And without the Nile, that country would be right back in the Libyan desert, and it would not be even for human habitation. As a result, down through the centuries, when famine came to other lands, they became the breadbasket because of that tremendous overflow. It's the biggest river in the world is the Nile River. It probably does more for cultivation than any other river. God made it that way. But the Nile became that which these people worshipped. It's the identical thing that Paul said. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. And in all Egyptian worship, and there are apparently four sources of religion in the land of Egypt, and in all four of those sources, they all go back to monotheism that there's one living and true God. But there came a day. When though they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was dark, and neither were they thankful. And they began to serve the creature rather than the creator. They began to worship four-footed creatures, animals, insects, and birds. What a parade. Why has man stooped so low? And he hasn't improved today at all. So the Nile was worshipped. Osiris sacred to him. You see, everything in Egypt is more or less built around him. You Have you seen his as the all-seeing eye, not the sun, as some seem to think, but the eye with all the rays running out from it? You see it in the architecture. You see it in the painting of Egypt today. It speaks to the fertility of the land. Life became death, and that which was fertile became sterile. It all became blood. God strikes the very beginning, that which was the very lifeblood of Egypt, and turned it to blood. That had its effect, but didn't change them. The second was frogs. 
dirty, ugly frogs. And somebody says, well, they didn't worship frogs, did they? You just don't think they did. One of the most beautiful, glorious temples that was in Memphis was the temple to Hika. Hika, the frog-headed goddess. And uh, according to that religion, nobody killed frogs. You just didn't. They were all sacred to Hika. Imagine waking up of a morning having frogs all over the place. And added to that, you can't kill them because of the fact that they're sacred to Hika, the frog-headed goddess. May I say to you, no wonder that, that this man, Pharaoh, called him. He said, come, Moses, let's get rid of them. We can't touch them, but you can. That was the second one. The third was that of lice. Keb was the earth god, and lice were made out of the dust of the earth, and they filled the land. He's now hit at the water supply. He now hits the land. God is striking, you see, at those vulnerable parts in the land of Egypt, actually where Egypt was very vulnerable. Then we come to the uh, the fifth, uh, the fourth one, that of the flies, or beetles, or scarabs. I have a picture taken of the largest scarab that they found today. You find them in all the tombs. They found it in King Tut's. The gold ones were taken out of there. They were sacred. They speak of eternal life. And they were sacred to Ra, the sun god. And uh, the beetle god was Kepara. And they worshipped, you see, these scarabs. They put them in their tomb. It was an evidence that they were going to live forever. It spoke of eternal life. Well, it's nice maybe to have them in your tomb, but you don't want to have them in bed with you. And imagine waking up and have them in bed. There actually is a certain amount of humor in the, these judgments. Uh, you can't help but feel like that God must have smiled when he sent some of these, when he sees how low his people can sink to worship these things, and then to wake up and find out they're in bed with the very thing they've been worshiping, that of uh, these flies, the beetles, or the scarab. Then the fifth one, and now he's beginning to close in on them. The murrain on the cattle. Now, Egypt was the land of zoolatry. We made a trip on this uh, trip that we were in Egypt out to the Steppe Pyramid. Literally hundreds now, they've just begun to unearth them there. The archaeologist is now digging them out. The hundreds and hundreds of mummies of bulls. What does it mean? Well, it means simply this that Apis, the black bull, and you find uh, many evidences of that. In fact, in Memphis itself, they worship uh, the Apis, the black bull. They had there the second largest temple that Egypt ever built was built to the black bull, Apis, the worship of Apis. God's hitting them now, and he's hitting them in a vulnerable spot, if you please. Imagine we're worshiping a sick cow. When, and you can't do anything about it at all. May I say to you that God is striking now at the very heart of blood. Now he moves in and closes in upon them personally. You have the boils, the sixth plague. The priests could not serve in the temple unless they were spotless. They couldn't have any mark on their bodies whatsoever. Well, may I say to you, they had a moratorium on worship in Egypt during this period because of the boils that were on all the priests. Nobody could serve anywhere. You see, he's beginning now to move in, and that judgment was actually a judgment on the entire religion of the land of Egypt. God's closing in on them. Now, the next was hail. God now begins to demonstrate his power as he moves in with this judgment. Egypt was a land of no rain. Cairo, I asked a man, I said, how much rainfall do you have here? He said, we had an inch last year. I said, is that normal? He said, yes. Well, I said, that's not much rain. He said, you ought to go up the Nile. He says, uh, rain up the Nile is a phenomenon. I mean, they just don't have it at all. So God is moving now into an area where no one could move or dared to move and that is to control the rain. They're now going to have a hail, but notice what it is. It's a hail of judgment upon them. 
And the Egyptians had called the even rain when they had it, they called it the tears of Isis, the goddess of the air. And when the Nile overflowed, they always call that the tears of Isis. May I say to you, God's really making her cry when he sent this judgment upon them. He's closing in upon the land of Egypt. Then there was the judgment of the locusts, and that was against the insect gods. The way they worshipped insects and birds is the most amazing thing. No people have been given over to that. We sometimes think that in the heart of Africa today that uh, they worship uh, there through the fetish worship, uh, that they worship these different animals and insects. It's nothing compared to the land of Egypt. In fact, evidently, that percolated down from the north of Africa to all the tribes of Africa, and it's where they got the idea of worshiping even these uh, insects, which is an awful thing. Now, insects, especially the locusts, has been a judgment. God has used them. You find the uh, not only here, but in the prophecy of Joel and the book of Revelation, that which is yet to come. God's making it clear now with the locusts that this is a judgment from him. And then you come to the ninth judgment. The, the Egyptians worship the sun, Ra Ammon. And now darkness comes over the land of Egypt in the daytime. This disk, you again, you see it, and you have to be careful of whether, when you see it, whether it's the eye or the disk of the sun in the art of Egypt today. Now, that is the art of Egypt you see today that goes back to this period. Well, may I say to you, when God moved in with darkness, he's moved in now against their chief god that they worship. He's also now moved in to where Pharaoh is abandoned. From here on, Moses will appear to him no more. He's had his opportunity to repent. Nine times God has given him an opportunity to repent, and from here on out, God will not offer him another opportunity. He that hardeneth his neck, or being often reproved, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. And then there came, if you please, the tenth and last judgment. God announced this would be the last to his people and to Egypt. He said, after this, I'll take my people out. And that's the death of the firstborn. Now, the firstborn of every creature, not only of man, but the firstborn of every creature. And you'll note that God to his people said that the firstborn belonged to him. And that actually goes back to the Garden of Eden. God claimed the firstborn. In fact, that's the reason Eve named Cain. She says, I've gotten the man, the deliverer. He's God's man. And from that day on, the firstborn always belonged to God, was given to the service of God. You find that carried over in England, in, uh, in the history of the English people. You find out that the firstborn, I do not think it holds good today, except among the nobility, but always among prominent people in England, the firstborn son either went to sea or into the army or the government or the church. One of the four, and they were taken in that order. The firstborn son would always seek to become a uh, commander in the uh, navy. And then the next son in the army, the next government service. And that's the reason you find so many English uh, men engaged in government is because of that precedent that had been set. They got it from the Word of God, if you please. God claimed the firstborn, if you please. And that night, that's the night that the death angel passed through, and from then on, God led his people out. And he had accomplished his fourfold purpose. He had executed judgment against the gods of Egypt. He had now convinced the Egyptians Imagine them letting this great company of slaves leaving the land. And then he convinced his own people because they go back even to this day in unbelief to the Passover, the night God led them out of the land of Egypt. God had accomplished his purpose in bringing them out of that land. And his judgment actually was against Satan, if you please. Now, I want to conclude. That conflict is going on today. 
it comes out in the open. I think every minister and every Christian probably sometimes in his experience sees that conflict come into the open. When I was pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, actually my first pastorate as an ordained man, there was a, a young lady, I say a young lady, she was about 12 or 13, that had been converted in the church. And she had a father that she loved a great deal. And he wouldn't come to church except on Easter and Christmas. And the first time that he came, she told me he was coming, and I told everybody to be sure and be nice to him and shake hands with him, and we did. And his criticism was that we overdid the thing. He didn't think that he, that you ought to be made over like that. And so when uh, that was Christmas, when Easter came around, I warned these folk, I said, now don't be too nice to him. And so after that service, he said we were a cold people. May I say you can't win with a fellow like that. He was without doubt. She had asked me to go see him. I went to see him. He was out without doubt the hardest man to talk to. He ran a dry cleaning place. And I found it extremely difficult uh, to talk to this man. I'd go to his plant and he'd purposely, when you start talking with him, he'd move over and start talking or doing something that would take him away, being absolutely rude and impolite in his dealings. One Saturday night, uh, my doorbell rang, and I do not like to be disturbed then before a message on Sunday. It was late. I went to the door, and there stood that man. And he said to me, he said, Would you mind explaining to me the plan of salvation? And I said, I'll be delighted to. But I want to know why you've come. Because I said, candidly, you are the last man I ever expected to knock on my door and ask me to explain the plan of salvation. He said, I'll be glad to tell you. He said, you know, my place of business is in a pool hall. And pool halls are now becoming respectable places. Well, the Yates brothers ran that pool hall in Nashville. They had both been converted, these brothers had been converted in the Ham Ramsey meeting there. And they continued to run a pool hall. They did not permit gambling nor profanity. So they had, they probably are the two men who initiated uh, respectable pool halls. And they, this man rented from them. And he said, uh, one of the reasons I resented talking to you has been because they have just worried me to death. They wanted to talk to me about the Lord. And I just don't even now want to talk with them, but I'd like for you to explain. But I said, why then have you come? Well, he said, I'll tell you why. He says, I have a cashier working for me. She came in the other day and she said to me, she said, uh, I've been to the fortune teller. And she laughed and I laughed. And uh, I said, well, what did the fortune teller tell you? Well, you know, he didn't have, or she didn't have very good news for either you or me. The fortune teller said that I was going to die suddenly in an accident and said the same thing is going to happen to the man I work for. He said last night she stepped off the streetcar, a car didn't stop, came by and hit her, killed her instantly. He said, that's the reason I'm here. So I brought him in and I got a piece of brown wrapping paper because you had to make it simple for this fella. And he even wanted to know about the dispensations. He said, my daughter's been talking about dispensation. And may I say that's still a good way to get the unsaved man to understand the word of God in spite of the opposition of certain seminaries today. So I put down a piece of brown wrapping paper and got out some crayon. And he and I both got down on our hands and knees and crawled up and down that wrapping paper. And right there on that wrapping paper, he bowed his head and accepted Christ. I've often thought about that. The devil went a little too far in that case. He overstepped himself. That woman, yes, she was killed. But I want to tell you, that man really turned to the Lord. May I say to you that we're told today in the Word of God that that is the place today where the devil's moving. You know, this morning he doesn't mind you being religious, and he doesn't mind you being a church member. He doesn't mind you doing anything. Except one thing, will you listen to what Paul says? But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, that's Satan, 
hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And then Paul goes on, says, in spite of that, but we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. May I say to you that the devil wants to blind you in only one spot, and that's this spot, that you will not accept Christ as your Savior. You can do anything else. The fact of the matter is, I'm not sure but what he wants you to join the church, provided you won't listen to the gospel. I'm sure that he wants you to be religious. My gracious, what do you think they had in the land of Egypt? And I doubt whether there was a person in the land of Egypt that was not religious. But they were blinded that God was a Savior. No Savior in the land of Egypt. No wonder later on God could say through the prophet, And beside me there is no Savior. He's the only Savior the world has. And the devil wants to blind you at that spot. You listening in today? That's exactly where he wants to blind you. He does not want you to come to Christ. He does not want you to accept him as your Savior. He wants you to do everything else except that. You expect him to do otherwise? If you have a prisoner locked up in a prison, and you have inviolate walls, impregnable fortress, and you have only one entrance and one exit, which would you guard? The back end of the prison that has no door and no one can get out, or where the door is? Well, at least give the devil credit for being intelligent, because he is. He's watching the door. Jesus said, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Has he blinded you at this particular spot? Has he got you shut in and you can't get out because you won't come? To the only exit out of this prison house of sin that you live in. I'm wondering if you are here today in this congregation, and I'd like to direct this to many of you listening in today. Multitudes of you I know are home listening to this message. You may be a church member. You may be a very religious person, very active. But honestly, this morning, have you really come to the one who is the doer? Have you really today accepted him as Savior? Has the light of the glorious gospel of Christ broken on your soul? There's a conflict going on today. It's a spiritual conflict. Heaven and hell are bidding for your soul. God and Satan. And Satan only has to watch one doer. That's Christ. He only has to watch one sacrifice, and that's the cross. He only has to watch one way, and that's Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. As he got you shut out today, this morning, may that veil be taken from your eyes. May you in simple faith trust him today, wherever you are, whoever you are, however you are, or wherever you are. Trust him today. That's our desire as well. If you'd like to know more about how you can trust Jesus as your Savior, then we'd like to help please visit ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? There you'll find several resources by Dr. McGee that will answer your questions and give you more information about this most important decision. Again, visit ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? Or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and we'll put a few resources in the mail to you right away. Join us this week for more of Dr. McGee's great teaching in Exodus on the daily program of Through the Bible. To download our app, listen online, or find a station near you that carries through the Bible, please visit ttb.org. Now we pray that our God will fill you with His grace, mercy, and peace until we meet again. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.